Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, another colloquium by the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia in Granada, here in Spain. Uh, please, I will ask everybody to uh, mute the microphones. And uh, today we will have the talk by Professor Mike Garrett. He will talk about the searching for techno signatures via anomalies in astronomical data. Um, Professor Garrett will be introduced by uh, Dr. Isabel Marquez. Please, Isabel. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming again to this uh, new uh, colloquium from the Severo Ochoa program at the Instituto de Astrofisica Andalucía. Thank you very much to our speaker for accepting our invitation that uh, I would like to extend to an uh, in-person one for the future when possible. Of course, we are very, uh, we acknowledge very much his uh, acceptation. Uh, Professor Michael uh, Garrett is the inaugural Sir Bernard Lovell Chair of Astrophysics at the University of Manchester and director of the Jodrell Bank Center uh, for Astrophysics. He did his first degree at the University of Glasgow in 1986 and then received a PhD from Manchester, Manchester in 1990. He's a former uh, director of GIVE really? from 2003 and 2007, and director general of Astron uh, till uh, 2016 in the Netherlands. As general uh, director of Astron, Professor Garrett was responsible for the final design, construction, commissioning, and operational phase of the 150 million euro low for telescope. He also have helped define the design of the Square Kilometer Array Telescope and previously coordinated several large European projects, namely Express, Radionet, and Asterix. Professor Garrett's scientific interests range from studies of compact cosmic objects in our own galaxy to investigations of the heart rate uh, systems in the early universe. Uh, Professor Garrett has a significant interest in SETI, so search for extraterrestrial intelligence and related uh, public outreach activities. He is currently co-chair of the International Academy of Astronautics, so uh, uh, another IAA, a uh, SETI permanent committee, and serves on the scientific advisory boards of the SETI Institute and Breakthrough Listen Initiative. In 1918, he developed a new multidisciplinary course at the uh, University of Manchester entitled are we alone? The course regularly attracts uh, about 150 students per year. Today, as uh, Rene said, he will talk about the search for techno signatures civilizations, the anomaly in astronomical data. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Garrett, and, and welcome to our colloquium. Thank, thanks very much, Isabel. Um, my, my internet connection has not been very good so far, so I hope it will be okay. Um, but um, it could be that I drop out now and again. Um, let me just share my screen. So I hope, hopefully you can see the, the first slide. Um, what yes, I'm gonna talk, you, you, you can, yeah? Yes, yeah. yes. Good, good. So, um, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be, uh, to be with you today and, and to give this talk. Um, Anchon and I go back um, a long, long time. I won't embarrass him by saying how long, but we were basically PhD students at the same time. And, and we came across each other in, in Bonn, I think, uh, more than 30 years ago, I think, so, so quite some time ago. Um, anyway, it's uh, lovely to be asked to, to give this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about sort of basically looking for strange things in astronomical data that, that might be signatures of, of other intelligent civilizations, and in particular, um, intelligent civilizations that are, are using a lot of, a lot of energy. And so, you know, our can appear in very sensitive astronomical observations. <clears throat> so for me, you know, the question about are we alone in the universe is really, it's really the thing that gets me out of bed 
in the morning. I've been doing astrophysics for, for a long, long time. And although I find it very, very interesting, um, there's nothing that really excites me quite as much as, as this question. And I think it's a question that excites a lot of people, um, not only scientists, but people from all walks of life. And I think that behoves us to, as scientists, to actually try and do a good job on such an important an important question. Uh, and as, as physicists and astronomers, we, we come to this question with quite a lot of bias. Um, we, you know, as a discipline, we believe greatly on the, the, the principle of mediocrity or the also called the Copernican principle, you know, which suggests to us that, you know, if life happened here on this planet, then, you know, given the right circumstances elsewhere in the universe, life should arise also in, in, in these locations. And if you look at the weight of numbers of, you know, number of stars in the Milky Way, the fact that mm -hmm. most of those stars have planetary systems, then you get to, you know, a huge number of potential locations for planets that are in the, in the habitable zone. Um, in, 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 the, in our own galaxy and other galaxies. So kind of on that basis, I think astronomers and, and physicists are, are very optimistic, typically, especially about sort of very basic life being fairly prevalent in the, in the universe. Um, the question of intelligent civilizations is sort of, sort of different. Um, it's, it's another thing that kind of obsesses Humanity is, you know, what would they, what would they look like, what would they be like, um, uh, and, and intelligence, of course, is something that arose on this planet only very recently, at least in in its current form of being able to um, understand the universe, for example. Uh, so, intelligence is is rather different. It's possible that intelligent life might actually be quite rare, even from a physicist perspective because many different things need to happen before you get a, a technical civilization like our own, for example. We've been on this planet, or life has been on this planet for, for well over three and a half billion years, and it's only in the last few hundred years that we've had a, a technical civilization that's capable of communicating uh, across sort of interstellar distances. And um, indeed, if you, if you go to other disciplines, so if you ask biologists, for example, what they consider to be the chances of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe, then an even basic, even basic life elsewhere in the universe, you can get a much more pessimistic view. Uh, and that is because, at least in our current understanding, a lot of apparently random events uh, have to happen. Um, before certainly before you get intelligence, but even to get multicellular life, um, in our current understanding, um, that takes a lot of different things to happen that might not happen very, very often. Uh, and so you you find biologists, even though we have these huge numbers in astronomy, that a biologist will say, well, actually the chance of all these things coming together in the way that they have is incredibly small. It's more or less the inverse of the number of locations. Uh, and so if you multiply those two things together, you, there might actually only be one uh, intelligent life form in the entire universe, never mind the, the galaxy. But personally, I think that's, that's a bit pessimistic. And I think it's partly because we don't actually understand how life um, arises. We haven't been able to sort of um, uh, synthesize life in the laboratory, although we, we might be coming kind of close to that. But so far, we don't really understand how life arises. And so a lot of this is, is quite speculative. And I also like to, to think about the fact that we're always learning new things. And, and typically, when we learn new things, that it actually, you know, it goes towards increasing the likelihood of, of life elsewhere, whether it's the fact that we know that there are planets around stars. You know, we, we didn't really know that as well as we know it today, 20 years ago. Um, or the fact that, you know, we know that we have visitors from other stellar systems. 
Um, and Oumuamua is a, is a good example of that, that might be transferring material, well, are transferring material from one stellar system to another stellar system, and potentially could actually be bringing life from one system to, to, to another system. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm particularly interested in this topic because I think astronomy is, is really about the big picture and, and trying to understand really sort of everything. And it's not just about looking up and, and ignoring um, what's happening on, on our own planet. And I particularly like this quote from Stephen Hawking. Um, which is, you know, to understand the universe, you must know about atoms, about the forces that bind them, the contours of space and time, the birth and death of stars, the dance of galaxies, the secrets of black holes. But that is not enough. These ideas cannot explain everything. They can explain the light of stars, but not the lights that shine from planet Earth. To understand these lights, you must know about life, about minds. And, and that really kind of defines for me why this is really interesting. Um, if you really want to understand the universe, you just cannot ignore the fact that, that there's life all around us. We know that life, for example, has transformed this astrophysical object that we live on, this planet Earth. Um, everything that we see has been transformed by life, even the color of the sky, for example. Um, so if you're an astronomer, you cannot ignore um, life if you want to really understand the universe in its entirety. So let me get on to the sort of things that many of us are studying and, and, I, and I'm studying in partic particular. Um, I think it's pretty clear that energy intensive civilizations, they, they modify their environment. We, we, we see that all around us. Uh, and one thing that I think we're all familiar with is that we have a huge sort of radio background, um, mainly due to um, a, a sort of plethora of billions of mobile devices. And although they're all individually very weak, we actually have a very strong background. So the idea which some people talk about that, that radio emission has sort of disappeared or has greatly reduced over the last few decades, that is artificial emission produced by, by uh, my, uh, humankind. Uh, that, that really is not the case. There's an enormous background now of mobile towers, of mobile devices, of Wi-Fi, um, uh, radio emission that just is all around us, whether we're sitting in our homes or offices, or you know, we're even outside in the in the countryside. And and that radio emission is actually also expanding into space. We, we, we are creating a cocoon of radio emission around the, around the planet in order to communicate with, with each other. Uh, so we have that background, but we also still have very strong signals and not far from, from where you're sitting, um, there are high gain antennas that are transmitting powerful signals to very distant spacecraft. Um, so that's one example of these sort of powerful transmissions that are being released from our planet um, very often, almost continuously, in fact, um, especially if you take into account the fact that we're also using very powerful um, civilian radar and in particular military radar over the horizon uh, radar, for, for example. So we have a mix of a background and, 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 and actually so many individual powerful uh, signals. And so a, a good example of a sort of anomalous signal that we've already detected in astronomical data is of course from our own um, distant spacecraft. And I think this is a, this is a nice example um, of, of what we would like to be able to detect using sort of radio SETI or at least traditional radio SETI where you can see, you know, a very narrow band signal, radio signal coming from Pioneer 10 in this case. So the, the most powerful part of that signal is confined to sort of a very small frequency range. Uh, and you can see that in this so-called waterfall plot, you can see that the frequency, uh, the central frequency of, of that carrier signal 
changes as a function of time. Um, it changes as a function of time because the, the relative velocity between the radio telescope and the spacecraft is changing. And it's mostly changing because the Earth is, is, is rotating. Uh, and since Pioneer 10 is well beyond the Earth, um, you, you see that in this Doppler shift of the, uh, of the signal. So you, you could say this is sort of the traditional sort of thing that, that, that SETI scientists who have been working in the radio part of the spectrum have been looking for for a long, a long, long time, since about 1960. Uh, but in fact, energy intensive civilizations produce um, signatures, not just in the radio, but they do it across the electromagnetic spectrum. It turns out radio is one of the places that we can most easily detect it. Um, but another place where we have really um, a lot of sensitivity, um, especially recently, is in the, in the mid-infrared. And so one of the things that energy intensive civilizations do is that they usually, um, they usually change energy from one form into another. And when they do that, they produce a lot of um, waste heat. And that waste heat produces a lot of excess in the, in the infrared, especially in the, in, in the mid-infrared. And, and you know that in your own common, common experience, if you're using computers or laptops, for example, if you use them, um, if, you, if, you, if you're using them, then they begin to, to heat up. And it's very difficult in physics to actually stop this. It's very expensive to, to actually try and um, make this invisible. So it's expected to be something that one might be able to detect from the activities of you know, an advanced civilization. So I've mentioned the first two of these kind of areas that we focus on at the moment. We focus on these at the moment because they're the, they're the sort of easiest for our instrumentation to detect. Um, and the third one that I haven't mentioned, um, and which has also been going on for you know probably more than 30 years, is looking for very narrow band optical emission, that optical emission coming from, from, from laser emission. So these are the three main sort of ways that SETI scientists are trying to detect sort of artificial um, signals from, from other civilizations. And in particular, um, there's been a real rejuvenation of, of this area of research. And in particular, uh, you see the gentleman there at the top and to the left, um, Yuri Milner has, has put, invested about a hundred million dollars into um, creating a real SETI capability using some of the largest radio telescopes, but also optical telescopes in the world. And I have to say that this has really transformed uh, the field. And, and the field is really, it's, it's not just confined as it was before to a few people in Berkeley. It, it's really something that you see people working on, on these topics all over the globe and especially in Europe. Um, especially uh, places like Italy, for example, which is really good. It's, it's, really, it's really good to see this. So I, I want to just present some recent results that I've been working on um, with, with some of my students. Um, one of the things that has always kind of annoyed me about traditional um, radio SETI is that we actually, we kind of tell lies about what we are doing. So we pretend when we take a radio telescope that we're looking at some nearby star that might look a little bit like the sun, for example. But, you know, if you know anything about radio telescopes, you know that that's not true. A radio telescope is sensitive to an area of the sky um, and, and typically at gigahertz frequencies with, you know, a 30 meter telescope, then you're sensitive to sort of an area the size of the, of the, of the full moon. So you're not just looking at one particular target star, nearby target star, you're, you're actually surveying many, many more stars within the field of view of the, of the radio telescope. And so um, recently we've tried to account for that. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is it's not just the fact that we're looking at a patch of sky, but that patch of sky also has depth. So we're looking at stars that, that are many stars 
that are within the, the, the beam that subs, subscribes the, 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 the galaxy. Uh, and again, this, this, this figure just gives you an idea. You see the target norms, but actually we're really surveying a lot of nearby stars, stars that will be um, located closer than the target typically, and many, many stars that are, are more distant than them. And up until now, we haven't really been able to say very much about this in terms of what it tells us on the incidence of sort of artificial signals, but, but Gaia has really changed that. So as, as you know, Gaia has measured something of order 2 billion, uh, 2 billion distances to, to, to 2 billion stars in the, in the galaxy. And so when we do SETI, we can actually do much better than we've been doing up until now because we can take account of all those foreground and, and many more background stars that we're actually also surveying um, when we when, when we do this, so that so that's something that we we published in in monthly notices um, at the end of of last year. It, it basically takes you know the sample of of um, breakthrough listen, so the published sample is about roughly a thousand stars have been looked at. But if you actually understand that you've looked at many more, in fact you've you've looked at several hundred thousand stars actually when you when you do these experiments, then you can you can actually place much better limits on the prevalence of of sort of high duty um, powerful transmitters, and that's the figure that we came up with. They are zero point zero four percent of stellar systems within two hundred parsecs. Now you, you you might see that that value of three times ten to the fourteen watts and think, well, that's roughly what the the power output of the entire planet is. But you have to remember that the, you get a huge gain if you if you put a parabolic telescope in front of a one megawatt transmitter, uh, and you can you know even we can reach these kind of uh, powers um, with a normal radio telescope or say a very large radio telescope like Arecibo, um, for example. Um, so other civilizations can probably you know do much better than than that. Uh, and one thing that we're also kind of thinking about is, you know, the fact it's not just sort of nearby stars in the galaxy, but it's also more distant objects and extra galactic systems um, that we're surveying as well. So we should really think about how we um, sort of place limits on, on these. That, that's more difficult because they're further away and there are a lot more propagation effects. Um, but I think there's, there's probably something that we can, we can still say about this. Um, and the extra galactic systems, although they're much further away, they do have one huge advantage, and that is, you know, that you're looking at, you know, 10 to the 12 stars, um, and you, you're looking at many multiples of 10 to the 12 stars in any given observation. Uh, in any case, this, we have a, a press release. I want to give credit um, to the, the master student who, who worked on this, Bart Vodarczyk Sroka. Um, that's Bart's picture on the left-hand side there. So um, he uh, he did all the hard work for for this. So the the other thing that I'm really interested, apart from radio city, is the is the mid infrared. Actually, I like the mid infrared in general, but but also for city, I think it's it's a very interesting area to 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 look at. Um, and and one thing that I worked on a long time ago was you know the fact that there's this correlation between radio emission and you know, either far infrared or mid infrared emission. There's a strong correlation. If a galaxy is bright in the radio, um, it'll, be, it'll be bright in the, in the mid infrared. And roughly, it's a sort of factor of roughly 10, depending on which sort of mid infrared band you're looking at. But the mid infrared is somewhere between sort of a few times to a um, hundred times brighter than the, the radio emission. And, and that's a law that, uh, you know, applies to many, many different um, galactic systems, uh, not just star forming systems, but all sorts of um, different galaxy types. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting is it extends not just in the local universe, but it, it seems to be something that applies um, also to, you know, cosmologically distant uh, galaxies. 
And of course, the, the reason that there is this correlation, or one of the reasons um, for normal galaxies, at least, that there is this correlation is that both the radio emission and the, and the, and the infrared, mid-infrared and far-infrared emission, but they're both dependent on uh, massive star formation. So the emission processes are both connected with, with massive star formation. And that's one of the reasons um, that you have this very tight correlation. Uh, so, so most normal galaxies that you look at are sort of falling within, within this sort of natural band, this natural ratio between the infrared and the, and the radio. Uh, and then you, you have these oddballs where, you know, the ratio is actually, the, the radio is actually um, much louder, if you like, than the, than the infrared. And so this ratio is actually very, very small. Uh, and these are the sort of radio galaxies that are studied by many people, um, where the radio emission is not really coming from star formation, or at least not predominantly from star formation, but is coming from um, accretion onto, onto a massive black hole. So you have these, these ratios, what, what are called Q values, that are very, very low, and that almost immediately tells you that you're dealing with a, a radio loud AGN. Um, now, one thing that people are not so interested in, and I'm not really sure why, is that you also have another part of this diagram where you can have really very high Q values, at least in principle. Um, and so the mid-infrared are sort of almost diametrically sort of opposed to what you have with radio um, galaxies. Um, you actually have very bright mid-infrared galaxies that have very sort of weak radio emission. But at least in principle, you have those, those systems. So, so they could be many different things astrophysically, perhaps. Um, actually, I don't think there are so many different things that can be. But, but one thing which is not astrophysical um, is that it could be the science of an advanced civilization. So an energy intensive civilization that's, losing, that's using a lot of energy. And it might be doing that for all sorts of different things. Maybe it likes to travel um, around the galaxy. Maybe it likes to to sort of move from star to star and occupy those stars. Um, but for whatever reason, um, you could have these Kardashev type two or type three civilizations that are producing a lot of energy, much, much more than, than we produce. But as a result of that, are also producing a lot of mid-infrared. So it's kind of fun to go and look to see if there are any objects out there that, that do have that excess. And so I've been doing that with um, a student um, PhD student here on the right, Hong Ying Chen. Um, I kind of more or less bullied her into this. She's, she's, she's much more interested in astrophysics than, than SETI, to be honest, but I managed to convince her that we should, we should have a go at this. So we just submitted the paper to, to monthly notices and we're, we're, we're going through referees' comments at the moment. But the sort of bottom line is that you don't really see many galaxies out there or any cosmic objects out there that have these very high values of, of Q. And if you do see them, then there's usually a sort of good natural explanation for them. So for example, you can get a lag between the, the, the infrared emission and the radio emission because the time scales are quite different. If you just have a, a burst of star formation, for example, then you can get quite high Q values in, 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 in very young star forming galaxies. Um, so, so that's that's just actually a snapshot of some, some of the research that we're doing in Manchester at the moment. Um, there's another couple of papers here um, that I haven't mentioned um, that are being worked on, uh, well, actually published um, by, by Chris Consolis, who's also in Manchester now, and by, by Eamon uh, Cairns. Uh, and if, if you want a sort of more popular view of some of this, then uh, I recently wrote uh, an article in the conversation that sums up some of these some of these uh, issues. Okay, and I just wanted to mention this um, this course that that I've created in Manchester as well. We, we we really have a huge response. It's one of the most popular sort of interdisciplinary courses in the universe. We uh, in the universe, <laughs> sorry, in the university. Um, and uh, we attract well over 100 students uh, every year um, in, this, uh, in, in this course, which is great. And it's great fun to teach. And it's 
amazing how enthusiastic people are from all sorts of different disciplines, how enthusiastic they are about this topic. And it, it makes me feel that astronomers need to do a bit more justice to, to this question than perhaps we, we do at the moment. I also want to mention this because um, I think it's been in the news, at least just before Christmas, that the, the Breakthrough Listen pro program um, had its first sort of um, real, uh, really good candidate for potentially being a, an artificial uh, signal. It's called BLC1, Breakthrough Listen Candidate Number One. Um, came out in The Guardian. It was leaked somehow or other um, internally. Uh, it came out in The Guardian in the middle of December. Um, and, and the thing that's interesting about this signal is that you actually see uh, a narrowband signal, but in addition to that, you also see a Doppler drift in that signal. So the frequency is, is actually changing. The observations were made while the Parkes radio telescope was, was actually doing something else. It was looking at radio flares from, from, from Proxima Centauri, which is, a, which is the dwarf star. Uh, and the data were, were some months later, and um, they were reanalyzed in, in the context of, of, of the SETI data that were taken at the same time. So this signal is seen, and it's not just seen like for a few minutes, um, which is sort of the case for, for many previous sort of um, potential SETI signals. It's actually in the data for many hours. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, it was, it was really, this signal was identified about a year after the observations were taken and, and subsequent observations made by Parks have not seen this narrow band uh, signal. So it's, it's extremely interesting. I think the conclusion is that it's not um, a, a signal from another civilization, that it is some kind of radio frequency interference, but um, it, it's actually not absolutely 100%, you know, they're not 100% sure that that is the case. Um, and so several papers are now in preparation on this really interesting result. And I think this will, this will move SETI on quite, quite a bit in terms of us thinking about the type of signals that, that we're looking for and how we, how we analyze the data and how we're definitive about characterizing the, the data. Um, I, I just want to go back to this point about radio telescopes. So people are saying, well, you know, it, your telescope was pointing at Proxima Centauri during these observations, um, but I just go back to the to the fact that actually the radio telescope is pointed at hundreds of thousands of actually millions of stars, even nearby stars, and it's much more likely that if this was a signal, it would be coming not from Proxima Centauri, which would to me seems a bit unlikely that that it would be coming from our our nearest star. Um, but it could be coming from uh, any of those stars in the, in, in the field of view. So this is likely to be the first of, of many sort of breakthrough lesson candidate events. The, the, the programme's really only started uh, and it's really ramping up because the, the 1 million star survey using Meerkat is, is just about to kick off. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of events that are uh, that look very anomalous, that look very interesting. Uh, and my guess uh, is that these are actually going to be very difficult to to really substantiate, um, to really characterise that these things will be coming and going, and that it'll it'll really be difficult to say definitively that that this is a SETI signal. And and one of the reasons that this is the case is because actually single dish radio telescopes are, are not really ideal for this for this kind of this kind of work so so how can we do better and one of the things i've been pushing for a number of years is that um, really we should be doing seti with multiple telescopes um, and and we should if possible also be doing interferometry with with those telescopes uh, that's really a much better way to be able to characterize a signal. Um, and, and the reasons for this, you know, are that, first of all, radio frequency interference, which is really the bane of, of a SETI, SETI researcher's life. It, you know, radio frequency interference is, is always present and produces sort of many, many false positives for a single dish. Um, but 
when you have two antennas or three antennas, um, that radio frequency interference doesn't correlate. So if the, the antennas are well separated, example, you know, say 50 kilometers away, then uh, the, the chance of, you know, a, a local signal in one antenna appearing in the beam of another antenna, you know, is, is very, very small. Um, but there's a second point, and that is that the, 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 when you're doing interferometry, you really only get a sort of coherent signal from the, from the, the, the place where you point the antennas. So the, the place that you point the, the interferometer. And if you don't, if, if you're outside of that, of that, that sort of fringe stopping position, then the signal decorrelates really quickly as you move off the move off the center of the field of view because you have a really high fringe rate and, and a fringe frequency rate. So, so interferometers are really a great way of um, doing doing SETI because they get rid of all the, the radio frequency interference that, that correlates in a single dish or even in two antennas that are on the on the same site. And the other thing that I think interferometry is important is that each arm of the interferometer provides a unique um, and really sort of independent measurement um, of, of whatever you're looking at. And, and, and that's completely different from a single dish. You know, a single dish can be um, really uh, sensitive to, to a lot of different things. You never quite know what it is, but with, a, with an interferometer, you have these independent measurements. So you're, your detection of a signal becomes much more robust with an interferometer than with with a single a single dish. And then, last but not least, you know, if you get you know a really sort of signal that's significant, then an interferometer can very easily pinpoint the location of the signal. The signal is very likely to be unresolved point source. You don't need to even make the best of images, but you can already um, produce a, a very sort of good uh, position for the signal. And as I mentioned before, a single dish cannot do that. Single dish only knows that it's coming from, you know, an area of sky about the, the size of the, of, the, of the full moon. And if you want to really um, be able to take your, your signal and identify it with a star, then you, you really need interferometry to, to, to be able to do that. And last but not least, if you can make sort of images of your signal as a function of frequency or a function of time, then you know it should be spatially invariant. It should always appear in the same place uh, at all times, at least for for objects that are sort of beyond the beyond the solar system. And in SETI, where just about everything is potentially changing, you know the signal is changing as a function of frequency because of the Doppler drift. It's also changing as a function of time potentially due to due to scintillation. Um, but, you know, having one invariant is actually really quite sort of useful and, and it really can characterize the, 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 the signal. Uh, and of course, you can also see motion. You, if, you, if you could detect a signal, for example, from a planet, then you would see the orbital motion of that planet for, you know, for a large range of distances in the, in the Milky Way. You'd be able to see um, also if it was on a free flying platform like a spacecraft, um, you could measure the motion of that, even, even a source spacecraft like our own Voyager, um, you could measure you know, the motion of that um, at, at a distance of a kiloparsec in a few years. So that's also the thing that, you know, SETI would really, you know, interferometry would really provide a sort of definitive um, uh, idea of, of whether the signal really was coming from uh, uh, another civilization or, or not. So anomalies in, in astronomical data. Um, I just want to talk about these kind of quite generally. I like this, this quote from Arthur C. Clarke. It's Clarke's, known as Clarke's third law. You know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from, from magic. Uh, and so when we do astronomy, we have to be prepared for things that we don't understand, things that actually don't um, uh, fit into our view or our model or our limited understanding of, of physics. Uh, and, and some people are doing that. And I just want to give you some examples uh, of, how, of how they're doing that. So I've already mentioned the sort of narrow band radio optical laser uh, emission. Um, but for example, um, you know, looking for, for non spherical transits. So where you have um, an object which isn't 
sort of circular or spherical in shape, uh, looking for these people are doing that, or looking for very deep transits, for example, the, the thing that we saw in Tabby Star, but which is very likely due to due to dust obscuration somewhere along the along the line of sight. So transits are, are pretty important, looking for um, anom anomalies in astronomical data, also looking for sort of extreme proper motions in stars using Gaia. Um, but also we've seen even in our own solar system, um, Avi Loeb, who has made some controversial statements about Oumuamua and the fact that it was, well, first of all, there are many things interesting about Oumuamua, um, but its dynamics are difficult to understand. Um, uh, and, and, and Avi Loeb has been suggesting some artificial reasons why it might have that motion. Um, spectroscopic versus geometric uh, distances. We, again, this is really Gaia. We can do this because of Gaia. We have geometrical distances for billions of stars now, um, but we can also look at the spe spectroscopic type and see if these two distances disagree. That might be evidence for something like a Dyson um, swarm, you know, where you have sort of collectors of of energy that swarm around the star and actually reduce its, its luminosity in certain parts of the, of the spectrum. Oops, sorry, wrong direction. Uh, and then unusual patterns in the sky um, or, or, or unusual variability. Uh, so, you know, we, we even see that in our own sky when we're looking at, you know, the, the latest launch of SpaceX, we see sort of unusual patterns that we know that they're not sort of natural but we can also do this so in astronomy. And, and one thing that I'd like to, 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 to highlight is sort of um, Beatrice uh, Vila Roel. She's been working on disappearing stars, so stars that you know were there in the 1950 sky plates, but have now completely disappeared. Um, and there's a lot of good astronomy to be done by looking at these, but we've got, we're going to be seeing much more of this kind of data coming from all the large survey telescopes over the next few years. So there's a there's a huge amount of data for people interested in looking at anomalies in astronomical data to get their, their teeth in. And then the last one is just sort of excesses um, in, in particular bands where you wouldn't expect them given the spectral energy distribution of a typical galaxy or, or whatever, quasar or whatever. Uh, and yeah, as I mentioned before, we, we really are entering into this survey era for, for, for astronomy. We have all these, these wonderful instruments that, that are coming. Um, the Rubin Observatory and the SKA, for example, and Euclid, in terms of being able to, to survey huge areas of sky really quickly. Uh, and as I said before, that's going to be you know, just a fantastic um, place to mine data looking for really unusual phenomena. And you know, if intelligence is extremely rare, for example, in the universe, then we, we really might need to be looking at many, many objects before we find that definitive evidence for intelligent life. And I think that's important. Um, I like this quote from, from a report, you know, that nothing would be more tragic than to encounter alien life and, and fail to recognize it. So I, I think we really need to do a better job as astronomers than, than, than we do at the, at the moment. And, and we have to open our minds up a bit about the, the possibilities and the potential that you know there could be anomalies in astronomical data that don't necessarily have a natural um, explanation. I'd also just like to talk quickly about setting astronomers. I think that we can sometimes be guilty of kind of working in splendid isolation. We think that we can understand the universe, as I mentioned before, just by looking up. Um, but I think there's, there's, there's a lot to understand just by looking around us. Um, the fact that, that this planet has been transformed by life, the fact that we have intelligent life, if we want to really understand the big picture, um, we need to take that on board. It's not just about looking up and trying to do apply physics to the, to the universe. It, it goes beyond that. And I, I, I'll be, become a bit more controversial here. So this, this probably sums up how most astronomers think about, you know, how you do um, astrophysics, you know, that any phenomena should not be declared artificial before all the natural explanations have been completely exhausted. And I tend to agree with that, I have to say, but I do like, you know, the fact that Kardashev, who was the, uh, his supervisor was um, uh, Shklovsky, 
and he said, you know, the presumption of naturality of every astronomical object is coercion over creativity. Each scientist has the right to work within the framework of, of their belief system and intuition. And I, I think it's sometimes good that we challenge ourselves. Um, I certainly think in terms of the first quote, but, you know, Kardashev was a great astrophysicist, father of uh, radio astron and many other theories um, in, in, in astrophysics. And it's very interesting to see the way other people, other people think. We don't all need to think in the same way. And you've probably seen this. I, I want to highlight it. Um, you know, this discussion between Avi Loeb and, and Jill Tarter, both of whom I respect very much in this field, um, that you know, there is a tension in astronomy and, and we saw that coming out in this discussion. Um, and I think that tension is, is, is there sometimes. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one. It's a current discussion, I think. And I, I'm, I just want to highlight it, that it's, it's out there and people are talking about it. Uh, so we, you know, we definitely want to, don't want to be in this situation where we, we almost blind ourselves by thinking that, you know, every phenomena in the universe has to have just some natural sort of cosmic explanation that, um, you know, other civilizations can also um, be actually influencing the, the data that we receive. So to, to finish off, just some, some speculative um, thinking. You know, Carol Sagan said, you know, that we are a way for the universe to know itself. It's very kind of Carol Sagan-ish, this thing. Um, and, and when he made that statement, he was thinking about, you know, humankind. He was thinking about human beings making sense of the universe. But if you look where we are today, then you would think that, you know, actually there's, there's something called AI and, and, and machine learning. And the fact that computers are continuing to advance and the, and the fact that we are marrying together things like computing and robotics and, and, and very small devices, nanotechnology, et cetera. Um, it's not impossible that, that we are actually creating a new form of intelligence, of, of, of machine intelligence. And that especially in SETI, for example, it could be, you know, in 10 years time, uh, maybe even less than that, it'll, that it'll really be our machines searching for, for their machines. Maybe every sort of biological intelligence that becomes sort of an advanced civilization produces very advanced machines that can be thought of as being intelligent and perhaps even being uh, conscious. Uh, and, you know, the, the fact that we happened, you know, that human beings happened, you know, that we have this intelligence, that we have this civilization, a tiny snapshot you know, out of, you know, the 13 billion years of history in the universe, you know, even within our solar system, there's still a long way to go. Many incredible things can happen over the next 8 billion years and beyond, beyond our own solar system. So we, we should be open to the ideas that, you know, other kinds of intelligences can actually, you know, potentially arise. And, and, and this is my picture of things, you know, that we have these cosmic foundations of dark energy, right? We don't really know very much about dark energy. We don't like to tell people that, but it's a fact, you know? You know, the, the stuff that we're applying to the rest of the universe, a lot of stuff we don't understand at all. Dark matter, you know? We've known about dark matter for nearly 100 years. We don't seem to be that much closer to actually understanding what it is. So we know a little bit about this baryonic universe and sort of stars and galaxies that we can touch and feel. There's a lot of stuff that we don't understand. Uh, and, you know, it, it's quite possible, I think, if we, if we think broadly enough that, you know, we are on one branch uh, of the intelligence tree that we had biological intelligence, um, but that that biological intelligence spawned machine intelligence, and, and that there may be other ways in which these cosmic foundations um, produce intelligence and, and actual consciousness, uh, and we need to be open to, the, to, to those possibilities. I like this quote by Thomas Hardy, the novelist. Um, well, well, much is too strange to be believed. Nothing is too strange to have happened. And I think we should consider these things. Oh, and just that if, you've, if you're interested, I've, I've written a chapter and uh, a book that I just put on the archive recently on, on some of these kind of speculative thoughts. Uh, and and th this is really the last part. So what SETI also teaches us, I think SETI teaches us, you know, a lot. It, it makes us question the things 
that that as physicists we don't often question. You know, maybe the maybe you know, can it really be true that there's really nothing special about us, nothing special about our planet? Maybe this principle of mediocrity is actually only sort of of limited application. Maybe we are special. Um, and if we are special, then, you know, we have lots of challenges facing us. And, and one of the things in SETI we're very interested in is, you know, the longevity of a civilization, because the longer a civilization is around for, the more likely we're, we're going to detect something. But we know that we're facing many challenges. We know that we're not living sustainably. We know that we're in, you know, the, the most recent mass extinction has already started. 75% of species will be extinct within the next you know, few few hundred years. It's a, an incredible uh, statistic. We know that we need to take better care of our planet and think about sustainability. Um, you know, and and we need to we need to look after each other. And it's not just about looking after our, our friends um, or our relatives. It, it's actually about looking after everyone on this planet. We we are on this fantastic cosmic spaceship which is zipping around the sun and zipping around the Milky Way. And there's so many interesting things still to come that we need to try and, and, and preserve that. So I think that's another thing that SETI makes us think about is our long-term future and, and the way we, we safeguard that. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I hope, you, I hope that the link wasn't, wasn't too bad and that you were able to follow uh, most of it. Um, and, and just leave with this summary slide. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Garrett. And uh, now the talk is open for questions. For uh, asking a question, please raise your hand for doing that uh, in the menu bar in the bottom. You have a reaction button there. You can find the uh, the, the bottom for rising hand. So we have some talks now, uh, some questions. The first one by Martin Ward, please, Martin. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so the great talk. Um, just a, a quick plug for the um, Beatrice Villa Roa thing. Uh, if you people want to follow this, there's an acronym called VASCO. Uh, and if you do the, the usual Google, but you have to put VASCO astronomy, otherwise you get the famous explorer uh, when, you, when you type in the word. <laughs> And there's a lot of work. This is the optical that you alluded to, looking for vanishing or appearing stars. And one of the problems is, of course, that we don't understand uh, we don't understand the um, accretion processes in supermassive black holes or even binaries that well. So we have to be careful about the interpretation of appearing stars. The idea is, of course, the Dyson sphere. If civilizations are that advanced, maybe they can build a sphere, but they'd have to do that on a time scale of 100 years because she's looking at the Palomar uh, photographic plates from the 1950s and comparing them with um, digital surveys in the present day. But just finally then a comment. I like the Martin Rees uh, comment, I forget which, pa which book it's in, about how the most likely signature we're likely to see would be some uh, catastrophic event for a extraterrestrial civilization, a sort of cosmic Chernobyl where their technology goes wrong and there's a big burst of radiation. So one should be aware of that. So it may not be that they're just trying to say hello. It might be that something went wrong with their technology. Anyway, thanks for the talk. Yeah, that's a good point, Martin. Um, and uh, indeed, I, I don't think of that e enough. And so it's good that you highlight that. And, and also the, the stuff that, um, that Beatrix is doing, um, Although I think she's really interested in the SETI aspects of it, there's a huge amount coming out just from astrophysics and supernovae and, 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 and all the spin-offs that are coming from that. Thank you. Uh, next question by Jose Diego. Hi, um, very nice talk, thank you. So I'm, I'm wondering if uh, one of the signatures that one may be looking for is um, assuming an advanced civilization is capable capable of um, space travel and you know they have I, I can imagine I don't know some engines that have like particle accelerators and something like that and uh, occasionally if they are if that uh, engine is pointing to us that may produce some electromagnetic uh, beam that could be detected somehow is, is that one possible signature? 
that one could be looking at. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah that that is a that is a possible signature. It's been it's one of the signatures been worked on. I think from you know the the, the early nineteen sixties, um, especially when when people were looking at um, nuclear propulsion uh, as a way of you know getting around the solar system even much much faster, or going to the nearest star. So. Uh, people have looked at that across the electromagnetic spectrum, um, looking at um, you know, like you would expect, I think, for example, in the radio, you probably expect um, sort of Bremsschilling um, uh, when you're if, if you're doing braking, if you're trying to brake as you as you get towards a star, for example, there's there's magnetic collimation maybe in these engines. So so you, you, it's not just optical emission, but actually I think across the electromagnetic spectrum. You would expect, you know, some of these proposed um, engines to to have a to have a signature that that we could that we could detect. And you know, again, I think you know the stuff that the the Beatrix Villarreal is doing, looking at disappearing stars, kind of falls into into this kind of area uh, as well as as all the other sort of parts of the spectrum. Okay, we have a, another questions. Emilio Alfaro, please. Uh, okay, thank you very much for this uh, challenging uh, talk. Uh, mm -hmm. My question is uh, regarding the infrared access and the slide you put, uh, you know, plotting the uh, infrared access for galaxies. Yeah. Uh, how many extraterrestrial uh, intelligence planet do you need to produce this high, this huge access? in these galaxies. Yeah, so, so you know, really, you, you're talking about Kardashev type three civilizations. So essentially, it means that you, you have to have um, Dyson spheres around a good fraction of the stars within a galaxy before you would really see a substantial uh, infrared excess. So, if, if you're looking within the within the galaxy, for example, or, or more near nearby, then you could you can probably do a better job. But for typical extragalactic systems, you're, you're looking for these so-called Kardashev type three civilizations, where the energy that you're using is equivalent to the to the solar output of of each star in the in the galaxy. So it's so it's it, it's enormous. And you could also say that it's quite unlikely, but you're also sensitive, not just to Kardashev type three systems, but also within nearby galaxies, you would be, you would be able to resolve uh, these into sort of civilizations and a transition from Kardashev type two to type three civilizations. But for really distant systems, um, you, you, need, you need a civilization that basically has, uh, I don't like to use the word colonize, but um, has, basically um, a, a presence and an energy presence in each stellar system in that galaxy. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next question by Lourdes. Hi, Hi nice to see you all. No, well, not right now, but nice to see you, Mike. <laughs> Hi, Lourdes. <laughs> um, uh, well, first, thank you for this very inspiring talk. I think that's a, you, you said very, very important things uh, in, in many different aspects. Um, I have, a, I have a, a specific question about, um, well, there, there are some diagrams that uh, I'm sure you know, I've seen them for the ATA, the, the Adam Telescope Array. These are uh, dispersion plots of frequency versus time of Fourier transform of, uh, of signals. So those are very amazing diagrams that allow to separate different kinds of signals like uh, a burst or uh, intermittent signals or continuous signals. So uh, those, uh, I've seen them from, from Jeff uh, Scargill and uh, he, he said, he explained how those uh, were being used in SETI to separate from this diagram, different kinds of signals, so to separate uh, uh, potentially uh, ET signals from, from human generated ones, or let's say uh, satellites, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking, well, apart uh, on whether you have any comment on this kind of diagram, I was thinking that this, there is a synergy here 
between studying the other parts of the universe and the search for intelligence. Because for, uh, for us for in radio astronomy and for SKA, it's, it's really more and more difficult to avoid uh, radio interferences. So developing ways to identify human signals is uh, very helpful to also remove uh, interferences from our observations uh, now with MeerKat in the future with, with the SKA. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, and I think there's a lot of useful work being, being done on that. And, and the, there is a lot of synergy between, especially now, I think, between SETI and just normal, normal astronomy. So you, you, obviously the RFI one is, is, is certainly something that's, that's interesting. Um, and, and classifying RFI and being able to do that in real time, for example, um, I think that's of interest to, to all communities that use, you know, radio telescopes or, or whatever. Um, but you also see something, you know, you know, SETI kind of is an extreme because you need a lot of resolution and frequency and you need a lot of resolution and time. And often, often, you, you know, astrophysically, you want one or you want the other. Um, and so I think that, that's quite interesting in terms of expanding just the, the, the sort of discovery space that we have for, for astronomy, but also means that SETI is doing a lot more astronomy. So the Breakthrough Listen team have been doing a lot of work on fast radio bursts, even though you know the telescopes they're using are really quite large, so they don't have large fields of view. Um, but they, they're doing that partly because they come from that community, a lot of them, um, but also um, just because it exercises the algorithms that they have, especially the machine learning, to, to be able to detect those bursts or to be able to detect, you know, something that might be artificial. Um, so, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There's, there's a lot of synergy in there. And I think we'll see that to continue to, to grow over the next few years, especially as you say, you know, um, the RFI environment is, is not getting any better. It's going to get a lot worse. Especially, you know, you know, for these big investments that we're making, like Meerkat and the SKA, I think, I think what we see happening at the moment with these constellations of satellites is really worrying. So there has to be a better way of taking these out of data than the way we currently do it, which is very, a very basic way of basically just cutting out particular parts of the, the spectrum and, and having different thresholds but not actually doing it intelligently. So we, we really need to do that intelligently in the future. And we also have to understand what the impact is on the veracity of our data as well, especially for cosmology. So. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is by Umut Demir Bosan. Uh, yes, hi. First of all, thank you for this great presentation. So my question is a little bit specific uh, about BLC1 signal. Uh, you talked that uh, actually it was discovered uh, more than one year after it was observed. So I would like to know the story behind that. Were people uh, checking for anomalies specifically for this or was it by chance or was it missed uh, from detection in the first hand? How did it happen? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so what I understand was that the observations were first made in the spring of, of 2019. And um, typically what happens is that if the PARC telescope is, so it was doing astronomy, the, the main, the main uh, observation was to look at Proxima Centauri and looking for radio flares from the, from the star. Um, but the, the Breakthrough Listen people had the SETI, the SETI system so, sort of can, can run in parallel with the main system. So they decided that they would, they would switch it on and they do that most, most times, in fact. Um, so the, the problem is that they, they're not analyzing that data, at least the data that they have come in. So they don't analyze that in real time. So they, you know, they put it onto disk and it, it sits there for a while. So it sat there for about a year um, when when a, a summer student came along and was given this data, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that no one thought there was anything very special about this data. The only thing that would be special is that it's um, it's pointing at Proxima Centauri. 
so can you still hear me by the way yes um so, yeah something changed on my my screen so um yeah the, i think the only thing that was interesting about it was it was pointed to proxima centauri and this poor summer student was given this huge amount of data to to go through and i think it was october last year that I first got a call from Andrew Simeon telling me that they had something really interesting and something they'd never seen before, which is basically a narrowband signal um, with, with, with the frequency changing. It doesn't change exactly as you would expect, and I can't really say much about that because it's, it's part of the paper, but I believe it's not just a linear change in the, in the frequency, which I think suggests that it's probably human, human made. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was a student, summer student that actually first um, came across this very interesting signal. It sounds a bit like pulsars, doesn't it? Um, and um, the, the person that's actually leading it now is um, uh, Sophia uh, Sheikh, who, who you might know, she's, she's, really, she's really great. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I can't say any more than, than that, that they're working on the papers now and it should be on, on the archive, I think, um, quite soon. But that's the reason for the delay is that well, it's a lot of data. It didn't seem as though it would be very interesting. Uh, and, and it was given to a, a summer student to, to look at it. And, and, and he brought it to the attention of his supervisor and then they got really excited by it. And that was in October last year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, next question by Miguel Perez Torres. Hi, Mike. Hi, Miguel. Um, uh, very nice talk. Congrats for that. Um, just so it's, it's a bit late, so very quickly. Uh, so uh, what are your thoughts about the follow-up observations with uh, interferometry? I, I really think this is the, the way to go, as, as you mentioned in your talk. So. What, are, what, are your, what is your idea that basically anything that uh, shows something with parks, you will follow up with uh, in reinterferometry or are you, are you having some kind of proprietary time? What, what are your thoughts about that? And then, well, my second question actually, well, you already said that you cannot tell anything more. So I want there to ask <laughs> about the signal. Um, so so the, the first part, um, yeah, I haven't really thought about it too much. As you know, as you probably know, we we got some some time on the VLBI network to, to to sort of have a look at the Kepler field and, and and just get a feel for the kind of things that we can do. And and there's a student who's coming in a few months to to look at that data. Um, but and so I think we will know a lot more about what it is that we have to do when we've actually actually looked at that data. Um, but, it, but at some level, you know, if there was something really interesting, um, then, you know, you could do something now. I think it's it, it, it more or less the same as the fast radio burst sort of follow up with the LBI, which I think has been really important to understanding the nature of yeah. FRP. You know, when you, when you can locate stuff, and, and you know this from your own work, but when you could, can locate an FRB with milli arc second resolution, that actually tells you a lot more than one arc second resolution. It really tells you where it lies within a, an extragalactic system, whether it's in a star forming region or whether it's next to the AGN or is it in the, in the outskirts of the galaxy, et cetera. So I think um, that has been really important in, in FRBs. And I think it could be the same with SETI, except it'll be a lot more difficult because FRBs are, well, at least to first order, fairly broadband where potentially a SETI signal, it doesn't have to be, but potentially a SETI signal is likely to be, to be very narrow band. Um, mm. So it would, I think one needs to really properly think, do, sit down and think about how you would do it. And it's actually something that's really worthwhile because I'm absolutely sure it'll just be like FRBs. As, as soon as you've got a few of these signals that are very tantalizing, you want to, fo you, you really want to follow them up with with VLBI, so it would be good to, to think about these things sooner rather, rather than later. Yeah. And, and in terms of BLC1, actually, I don't know, I don't know any more than, than what I've said, except that um, the conclusions of the papers will be that this is human made, um, but it has characteristics that are very, 
very strange in terms of the, the Doppler um, drifting and the changes in frequency uh, and exactly what it can be. Um, I think they, they were certainly, when I spoke to Andrew a couple of weeks ago, they, 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 they are still really not sure. But I think it, it really goes to show that, you know, what you want, even, even if you don't do interferometry, you actually at least want multiple telescopes doing this kind of stuff. And if you've got multiple telescopes, you may as well do interferometry as well, because you have all the time and frequency um, resolution to, to cover the whole field of view. Okay. So yeah, just, just a very, very, very last question. So did you find some kind of repeatability in that signal? Or if you could split the data, would you would still see the same, the same signal in the, in the two halves or something like that? You cannot comment on this? Yeah, yeah. So they, so, so they, they were they, they were bound to the to the overall schedule. Usually in SETI, uh, the breakthrough lesson, they do five minutes on source and five minutes off source. But here it was sort of 30 minutes on source and then 30 minutes to a calibrator. Uh, and so basically when you go to the calibrator, the signal disappears. And then when you come back onto the source, i.e. Proxima Centauri of that field, uh, the signal comes back. Uh, and it does this many, many times. Uh, over the course of a day. Yeah. But but hasn't been seen since. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank yeah. you very much. There is a question in the chat by Carlos Abia. What do you think about the Fermi's paradox? Ah, uh, yeah, the Fermi paradox, yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I reviewed a book on it <laughs> a while back um, by, by Duncan uh, Forgan, um, who, who was an exoplanet person. And um, it's a really good book. If you're interested in it, you, you should go and have a look at it. Kind of the Fermi paradox, really, it kind of hurts my head to think about it and think about all the explanations for it. I think, I think the Fermi paradox is um, it's really interesting. I think the fact that we don't already see obvious artificial anomalies in astronomical data is telling us something important. I think it, I think personally it's telling us that um, advanced civilizations, at least energy intensive civilizations like our, our own, um, either, either there's, there, there's not many of them or they're not around for a very long, a long while. Um, and so that, that, that's what I take out of the Fermi paradox, you know, that we, we just don't see much evidence for aliens in, in, in the data that we, that we already have. And I think that's not a reason to stop looking. I think, I think we should be looking and we should be, we should be open to it. Um, but yeah, for the Fermi paradox to me tells me um, that this is going to be a difficult thing to do, that SETI will be difficult. Well, we know that because you know, okay, we've been looking at it, nominally looking for a signal since 1960, but I can tell you that those surveys, you know, what Breakthrough Lesson does in a day is what all those surveys did over 60 years. Um, actually, Breakthrough Lesson does even more than that. Um, and and I, 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 so I'm not quite sure how I go down to that, 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 that train of thought, but, you know, I think it is still sort of worth, worth, worth looking for these signals because the equipment we have now is much, much better than it was before. And, you know, you never know when you're on the brink of that detection. I, I look at gravitational waves, for example. Um, you know, I was at the University of Glasgow where they developed the interferometry system that actually, you know, was the basis for detecting gravitational waves. And, and that, that's back in the 1980s. We used to joke the only thing that you could detect was the Glasgow underground trains, but you'd never det detect a gravitational wave. And that was correct. But over the years, you know, they got better and better and they made better and better instruments. And eventually they detected the signal. And, you know, if I'm on, with an optimistic hat on, I, I'd like to think that SETI is the same, that as our telescopes get better, um, we will eventually sort of detect, we get above that threshold where we make a detection. Thank you very much. And then for ending this uh, talk, Anchon will uh, ask the, some questions or give him some yeah. words. Okay, Anchon. thanks. Thanks, René. Thanks, Mike, for first accepting our invitation to give this very nice talk. 
and very inspiring, as Lourdes has mentioned before. I, I have first a, a, a question. I mean, we, we already had a lot of archive data that have been correlated with a very fine time and frequency resolution that in principle should be okay for, for these SETI searches. Are, do you have any criteria to look in those archives for the signal? Uh, it's a good point. It's a very good point. <laughs> um, so there are many of those data sets and, and I'm responsible for a lot of them, I think. And you could, you could take those uh, and you could look at you could look at, with Gaia, you could look at within the field of view, all the galactic stars that are, that are going to be there. And you could, you could do some very interesting stuff because those observations are also very sensitive. They're not just using one single disk, but, but using, I don't know, 16, 20 of them uh, or so, and, and some of the biggest in the world. So um, it's, a, it's a good point um, that, that that is a resource that, that could be looked at, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, the, the last one, I mean, the last question, before I say some words just to finish this, this talk is, do you submit proposals for city searches? Well, no, you don't. Well, you, <laughs> um, so, so, so the Breakthrough Listen Initiative, for example, is buying time on the, on the GBT. So it has 25% of the time on GBT and about, about something similar on, on parks. Mm -hmm. uh, it is um, also negoti negotiating to do commensal surveys where it, it's only bringing a back end to Meerkat, for example. So the Million Star Survey um, will be, will be, be using the commensal system. Is the thing to do, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the commensal, I think, is, yeah, I, I, I'm a great believer. I, I really don't believe in pointing at M dwarfs or pointing at such and such or pointing at the center of the galaxy. I just really don't believe in that. Um, I think, you know, you can point anywhere and you're doing a, a good and interesting job. So they're also bringing um, similar systems to the, to the JVLA uh, in the near future um, as well. So, uh, so I think that's, that's useful. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mike, really thanks a lot for your very nice talk. Uh, I mean, yes, to, to make the point clear, it was 87 when we met for the first time. Okay. As students. It's already 33 years. It was fun, <laughs> and it was very really good to have you close to me. I mean, we were <laughs> both of us starting in our career, yeah. and it, it was good to learn from good friends and then have a beer, yes, to yeah. <laughs> relax ourselves after some, some days of work. I mean, it's, I remember that perfectly. Okay, uh, I, I want to let you know to all of you that the visit of Mike to our institute was already foreseen be before the pandemic came to our lives. And I hope he will be coming. Of course, we invited him to come here to the institute. In fact, at that time, it was February 2020. We, we were already negotiating an agreement between both institutions as to start the cooperation in many different fields between the University of Manchester, the Jodor Bank Center for Astrophysics, and our institute, the IAA. I am sure that we will finish this, this memorandum of understanding and a very powerful cooperation will be developed. And I hope you will be coming then to visit us. Although you have been in Granada many times, I think, no? At least you were here in 2019 for the EVN conference and, okay, and some of yeah, the times. Yeah, I've been there a few times and it would be, be wonderful to go back, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot, Mike, then. And see, you, see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank